Welcome everybody. This is <laughs> Minor Ramos, the principal defender with the show Truth and Equity. I'm joined by Mr. Al Mills, the prophetic financier, and also with Lauren, the solutionist. Welcome everybody. I am hey, so man. excited. Welcome. This is an exciting time to be alive. This is a great yes. day to, you know, to come together and do this and uh you know, before we get uh, get going on our conversation, mm -hmm. uh, just want to, you know, it's it's really interesting to me that what we see in the marketplace doesn't shock people, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about credit today. We're going to talk about banking today, but mm -hmm. um, I want to thank the TPF, the Prophetic Financier, for bringing us some information that really just opens up opens our eyes to the reality of, right. you know, why Velocitas Banking exists, why in the world did we, you know, co-found this company called Velocitas Banking because we want to help people to bank better. We want to help people to, you know, get higher than average returns. But listen to this, um, you know, this, this one shocked me because what I realized is that when people take their hard earned money, and they go and they, you know, deposit their money at the banks, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> it is their money. It is, you know, it's their asset. It's a liability against the bank. But this is what happens. And, uh, you know, it, it's just shocking to me. In, in last year, there were about $1.2 billion in ATM fees alone. So let me break that down for you. So you go... <laughs> to Publix or whatever, and you just need to get out. Remember, it's your money. You go and you take, you swipe it and <laughs> swipe that card. Out. There were $1.2 billion that were charged for ATM fees. Yes. Right? I don't know how you feel about that. I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking about this. It's like, uh, <laughs> when, when you break it down, it's like, you know, like it, it's astounding information. Right. I think this this one is the one that gets me personally because you know I, I think about this all the time. I don't know I don't know if you ever 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 had a ten dollar bill mm -hmm. and it kind of flew away. You were you know getting your kind of flew away. You run after it right, and mm -hmm. you want to make sure you get it. Well, last year there were two point five billion dollars in account fees and bounce check is, fees. Yeah, right. Most people don't even like think and stop <laughs> and think about that, right? Right. But this is the one, this is the one that gets me the most. This is the one that I cannot fathom the the reality of this. I cannot fathom the the end user, you know, being basically they're they're being robbed in front, you know, like in the open, you know, in the in public. Nobody even robbed without a gun. Five <laughs> $5.7 billion in overdraft fees. And that usually comes with somebody that might have two or three bank accounts. That's and they correct. have enough money in one, but they're going to charge it anyway, like me, just because they didn't tie it in. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to, I'm just going to open up by saying this. Um, that would never happen in Velocitas Banking, right? <laughs> it's not, that's not what it was going to happen. So, you know, let, let's talk about, um, let's talk about how do we communicate with our community, our fellow hardworking individuals and help them really understand that their hard earned money, you know, they, they need to see where this is going. Where do we start the conversation? What do you think? Well, uh, Lauren, would you like to go first or would you like me to go first? I want to hear what you have to say. See if it's well, I, I think the first thing we have to first do is make them aware that they're being victimized. And what we would call an invisible tyranny type of act because it's hidden in plain sight. You bank your money there, in essence, you're really giving a bank an interest free loan. The moment that you bank it there, and then they have the audacity to want to charge you fees for utilizing that service. Think about that. So I think the first thing we have to do is make them aware of the fact that they are victimized and show them how. See, then we're running into a Schrodinger's or a Schrodinger's cat type of situation. They go and they start protecting the banks. No, they would never do that to me. 
no, that's not happening. That's a scam. All of a sudden, <laughs> we have that Schrodinger's cat phenomenon happening. And it's not a scam. It's, they've been doing it under our noses since always. Right. And it just becomes so ingrained in our society and, you know, our everyday existence. <laughs> I don't know. How could that be a scam? It happens every day, all day long. How could that be a scam? Crazy. And then you, you bring it to, to the light. Right. And it, it, it makes it a little bit harder to help people see the light um, because nobody really wants to believe that they've been scammed and lied to for that long and that severely. Well, I, I think the fundamental premise that they need to come to knowledge on is the fact that what is a bank? You see, there's been a lot of marketing that's been done to create a perception. You've always relate a bank to a Gothic or more of a Roman type of structured building with pillars, right? And then they always attach it to a, a safe, a big giant safe with these massive bolts and the big spinning wheel. And that gives you that perception that your money is being placed in there and no one can get to it. So that's the psychological profile that they create you. But the fact of the matter is, what is a bank? A bank is nothing more than a depository institution, a depository institution. Now, we, now we, if you do the Google on that and you say, well, what's a depository institution? What's being deposited? Well, if people think that it's their money, but in reality, it's their negotiable instruments because the money that they're allegedly depositing is nothing more than fiat currency, a.k.a. a note some form of a negotiable instrument that was created by the Federal Reserve and the Treasury. That's why if you ever look at a note, a dollar bill, a $10 bill, there's a seal of the Federal Reserve Bank and there's a seal for the United States Treasury and there are two signatures on the front of that document and there's also a serial number. So anyone who knows basic contract law, basic contracts, you have two signatures and a contract number. So you're really depositing a promissory note of some sort, right? right? Now, again, bringing back the truth, the only true currency or money in the United States is gold, silver, and coin. Gold coin or silver coins. That is the only true form of money. So I think once we get to that truth, we can understand that it's nothing more than receipts that the bank has been receiving. It's just a receipt. That's beautiful. And, you know, uh, you know, because we do talk about truth and equity here, um, you know, we, we really do want to just kind of highlight and just bring sure. these topics to the forefront mm -hmm. so that people can start to feel a little bit more comfortable about having these conversations. Because uh, Lauren's right. I mean, like there's denial. Oh, they, they would never do that to me. Oh, you know, that's not true. <laughs> right. But, but it has ramifications. They, I mean, there are some things that people will actually suffer from right. these things. So, so let me let me point that in, and I want to I want to get into a little bit of the credit stuff because, you know, Lauren, if if you think about this, the solution is will tell you know the um, you know the the audience today. If somebody went to get a loan for a home, you know mortgage, a you know, mortgage loan, um, the underwriter is going to look at not only their credit, they're going to mm -hmm. look at the assets that they have, and when they find something that's called an NSF, right? <laughs> oh, they're gonna, what is this, right? How did this happen? <laughs> Mr. Client, Mr., Mr., you know, you wanna get a loan, you don't know how to manage your money, here's an NSF, why don't you write me a letter of explanation and yes. tell me, the lender, why you couldn't manage your money? So the solution is, why don't you speak to that a little bit? Because, you know, that does co go into, into the, uh, the credit side. Mm -hmm. Where do you want me to start? You started off at NSF, and then I went and started my own <laughs> going off into <laughs> the check systems and that it doesn't, it doesn't go off and die. Um, right. So where do you want me to start? Because NSF, it, it carries check systems is it's another credit report, credit profile that pertains specifically to banks and banking systems. Right. So anytime 
we have a non-sufficient funds notice or it's persisted for um, X number of hours, every bank knows about it. it, it it's in black and white. It's there for it's It's, it's digital until the end yes. of time. Right. So it is kind of sad that, you know, maybe your accounts didn't queue up or like you had mentioned earlier, you had an account, you had tons of money in the other account. It just doesn't, it wasn't tied there. So the NSF, right. it was, it was arbitrary only because it was that one account. You had two or three other accounts with plenty of money in them. Um, so indeed there wasn't really an NSF, you know, that name, plenty of money, but it was just well, highly, especially for the banking institution, that particular don't didn't have money so they capitalized off of that and then they went and told mr client you don't have any money mr client says what are you talking about i have plenty of money mm -hmm. you look at my accounts every day you charge me plenty of fees you never miss on a fee but of course i have money right so how the word though non-sufficient funds didn't say money didn't say money didn't say so the account wasn't funded didn't mean it didn't have money in the in the associated accounts, mm -hmm. right. exactly. So funding. From, now they're talking about funding. Let's go on the other side because um, you know the solution is always you know works at profiles mm -hmm. for fundability, right? right. So yeah. I mean, does this have any? I mean, once it's done, it's done. It's kind of like the damage is done. And, you know, right. we, we'll talk about some solutions that you know that people can can you know act on and fix before you know somebody right. that looking at their profile and saying, oh, this doesn't work. Right. Um, but from from a you know to be fundable, um, mm -hmm. you know how does how does that affect you know their you know their credit profile with you know having these assets that they have to take a look at? I mean, you work hard on one side to fix their profile, but then this little thing over here, right, mm -hmm. can affect you know their fundability. Yes, um, when it comes to let's for for an example, an NSF, an underwriter would be able to uncover that using check systems. Consumers, when we're doing diligence, building the profile for fundability, we're going to make sure that we're going to the ends of the earth to make sure that we've gathered up and we know our own dirt, we know our own skeletons, so that we know what to attack. Now, yes, that does mean that we're we're using other avenues that maybe, for sure, other credit companies don't. Mm -hmm. um, but that also means that we're exposing the skeletons in the closets before they come out to scare a underwriter. You know, we're going to go ahead and expose those and fix them before, you know, they become, I don't want to say public knowledge because they already are, but in the front of the underwriter's nose, we can kind of that, clean it off okay. so that you don't have that, uh, that stigma. When you're talking to the underwriter, sure, it might be there, but you don't have that stigma when you're talking to the underwriter because you went through the due diligence and you pulled the different reports to make sure that you were getting from the farthest reaches the end of the earth, I'd like to say. Gotcha. So, so there, uh, you know, um, TPF, anything on your end? Uh, I'd like to add to that. It's interesting that that would even be brought up because that's a banking report and not a consumer credit report because the NSF has nothing to do with the issuance of credit right. in any sort. So that's where the third party aggregators come in, where they are um, reporting information to these bureaus that really have information they shouldn't even have, if you will. So I, I think that's one of the issues. But like you said, take front, you need to really take, a, take front of the situation before it happens and be transparent about it so that the underwriter would know exactly what is what. Yeah. I want to talk about a little bit more about the solution, so we'll think about that. But you did mention something that, you know, you, you mentioned third-party aggregators. And, you know, I just, I, I, I don't want to assume that our audience knows exactly, you know, what, what that's referring to. So can you shed some light on the, on the third-party aggregators and why we love them so much? <laughs> So when, when I speak to clients or you know, even just people in my everyday goings on, um, right. they think that the only people, entities reporting their personal information is your TransUnion, Experian, Equifax. Sometimes you'll hear someone say LexisNexis. They've got that, that, that cute call that they're coming up in the world. Right. But yes. 
these big three, big four, are actually gathering their information from other smaller aggregators that are getting industry-specific type of things, things that have to do with your purchasing habits, your insurance habits, um, your driving habits, the things that they have information Mm -hmm. would turn your stomach. You would expect an investigator who somebody paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to uncover this information. That's what you would expect somebody to have this for, right? <laughs> not, not the guy who's reporting it to the transunions, the experience, the Equifaxes, but this is what they have. And entities, corporations are purchasing your information that you didn't even know they had, didn't give permission to give it out. Uh, they're buying that. And that's where you're seeing it reported to your credit report. So it, it's not the big three, the big four, your, your TransUnion, Experian, Equifax that mm-hmm. are gathering the information. They're just getting it from somebody else. Well, look, look, I'd like to jump in there really quickly. Here's a fact check, fact checker. Over $4 billion was generated just on the sale of private information like that to the credit reporting agencies. So just think of this, LexisNexis, SageStream, and any of the other top, top three in that space made billions of dollars selling consumers' information that may be public in another forum, but they're selling it to the credit reporting agency and making a fortune. Making a fortune? They didn't have your permission? A lot of them don't even have any idea it's happening. (laughs) Digital society, people still have no idea that their information is traded for monetary exchange and been cut out of the entire deal. Sure. Oh, no, that couldn't happen. That's a scam. That's a lie. It's been forever. <laughs> yeah. And, it, you know, it's it's so interesting because now we're, you know, we're we're just we're really uncovering and discovering for, you know, for anybody that, you know, maybe is just joining, you know, they're, they're listening mm-hmm. to the podcast and they're just going to we're talking truth and equity here and we want, you know, to inform you know, our community about all these things that are really important. But now, you know, we went, we went to, you know, talking about the third party aggregators. And as you know, I think Facebook was the one that announced recently that their data was breached, right? Like, oh, so how many times has this happened? Right. And when we're talking about protecting our, our, our identity, our, our resources, right. We do everything we can on our end. Why aren't these humongous organizations and corporations taking the same due diligence to protect us? That's a good question. That's a, that's a very, very good question. That's a, that's a really great question. Um, I, I think for the most part is that I think it's a big business in data breaching. That's just of my opinion. Um, just think of it this way. If they didn't have data breaches, well, let me go back. There's something called the synthesis, the synthesis and the anti-synthesis. So you have to create a situation. So if data breaches happen, what creates a commercial opportunity? Monitoring services. Mm. See, so you have to constantly create these events to subsidize the other side of the coin in business. If everyone's data was safe and there were never any breaches, would anyone be buying? be buying uh, uh, services like that, would they be purchasing credit credit monitoring services if the information wasn't gonna be sold to the dark web? Think about that. Yeah, so what, what you're really talking about is big business and you know, it just- it reminded, business. <laughs> it reminded me like, there are some people here that love automobiles and remember the remember the, the exploding Pintos, remember those? Yes. <laughs> so around that time, what was happening is they absolutely knew that there was a, a product defect, right? But they analyzed it and they said, look, out of out of all the accidents that it could happen, only a certain amount of people will die. If we mm. fix the problem, if we go back and fix the problem, it's going to cost us a hundred times more than facing a liability from these people dying. I mean, that's it's true. crazy that's to think that, right? That's but that's how big business looks at this. So basically what you're saying is it's possible that, hey, there was a breach, but you know what? We'll pay for your 12 month monitoring service for free right right? so that you can you know recapture the you know your your security or your faith in us right that's the word security what 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 what, the solution is i mean think about that for a second (laughs) somebody somebody 
<laughs> comes up is, oh, I am, I am getting a, a 12 month monitoring service. Oh, what would you say to them? No kidding. This has actually happened to me, right? My really? information on a number of occasions was involved in, in the breaches and every time, without fail, I get a notice, you know, about a class action lawsuit, but they'll go ahead and they'll pay for the 12 or this last one was six years of ID monitoring theft letter service. That was six. It was a good wow, deal. Wow, six years. Wow. Big deal. Um, but it's usually a year. And this is this is what they do. They, they do try to, to regain your confidence. But, you know, like like TPF pointed out, it is it's it's big business. It's mm-hmm. big business. It's not going to go away. Um, maybe we'll get sweeter deals out of it instead of six years of credit monitoring. Um, but you know, credit monitoring that aside, we're talking about bank accounts. We hit a little bit on social media and now we're on credit monitoring. Let's get on that boat. We monitor our bank accounts. We have all sorts of apps on every single device that we possibly possess, probably our watches, right? We monitor our currency. We have apps everywhere to monitor our crypto. Um, that's run of the mill every day, but nobody monitors their credit. Oh no, what? no, that's another bill. No, why would I do that? I don't want to pay another bill. But what they're not realizing is credit is the thing that's going to give you access to funds um, at your beck and call. Right. So uh, monitoring your credit. Yes, monitor your credit more than your darn stinking bank account because your bank account is a finite number. Uh, to which you can add and subtract from, or your bills can. Uh, But credit is, it can be infinite. If you're building your profiles for fundability and you're you're getting advice on the right types of accounts and the right types of cards to to possess and how to use it, it's infinite. You have access to money. Um, Why aren't you monitoring that every day, day in and day out? Why don't you have a service? But why are you checking the bank account where they're taking, what, $17 every month for what? Nothing? For what? In this new economy, the bank, the new bank account is your credit. (laughs) Is your credit. Yes. Um, Why aren't we monitoring this? Sorry, I had to get on my little soapbox for a second. (laughs) And, and and that's precisely the reason, you know, why we're having this conversation, because I think, you know, from a public service uh, perspective, I mean, we're going to talk about the things that people don't want to talk about. I mean, we're, we're going to present. Absolutely. This they have to. Yeah. Yeah. What was what was your thought? No, so we're going to bring the naked truth. It's, it's always yeah. about the naked truth. And to, to kind of go back to what to, to Lauren's point in reference to credit monitoring, how about this? Theft insurance, identity theft insurance. Folks don't even realize that when you become, when you get access to credit monitoring, you can also receive up to a million to a million and a half dollars in in ID theft protection. But what people- and your family. Is how difficult and painstaking restoring identity theft is. It's not a, a six month process. You write a letter saying, oh, it wasn't me. It can take years and a million dollars. Um, so having the, the ID theft insurance or credit monitoring so that you can see it happen. In real time. Before it blows up in your face. Before <laughs> it blows up in your face, you're catching it. Why? Just why? It's I think so- because we lack, we lack the knowledge of self. I think consumers don't know who they are. They don't really know what positioning and foothold they have in this whole microcosm called economy. They don't know that. And until a person gets to know who they really are in this process, they will be taken advantage of. They will always be the recipient of unfavorable behavior from the big corporations. Just think about that. Corporations are ruling the lives of individuals. And to add to that, and I'll, and I'll hand it back over to you, Minor. Um, look at today, um, the Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas had even spoke to the issue of the First Amendment, that how private corporations have no right to silence the freedom of speech. 
in this country. But yet, examples of they shut, they close people's accounts down and silence them so they don't have a voice. Think about that. Yeah. yeah. So it's coming back to the same thing: your voice, your sound. You, it needs to be freely given. And until you know who you are, you can't even emanate that sound. Mm -hmm. And so this conversation is really great. It's dear to my heart that we're able to, like you said, bring the naked truth, truth and equity. Because if you don't have truth and equity, you're in iniquity. Ooh, <laughs> that's good. Because you're no longer in the alignment of your true self. Yeah. That means you're now, you're disqualified. You're Upside in down, inside out. That's yeah. correct. So it's a great thing. So this conversation really got me excited. Yeah, no, this, this is great. And you know, the, the reality is that, I mean, we can, we can sit here and, and go through this for hours and hours, but we want to be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of, you know, wrap up from, from a, you know, I'll give, I'll give some, 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 uh, a closing conversation about the loss of dust banking. And I'd like um, TPF, if you could, you know, close close up on on Empire sure, absolutely, absolutely. and then also uh, Lauren, you know, the, the solution. So let me go for first real quick. So obviously, you're you're hearing some valuable information, and our mission is that you'll take this to heart, to the, you know, the highest capacity of your mind and and your soul for for you to build wealth for you to take care of your family, for you to recapture all the hard work that you've been, that you've been, you know, uh, participating. I mean, like I told you, you know, $10 billion worth of junk fees, right? Yes. I mean, how do you recapture yes. that? With Velocitas Banking, you know, we, we are going to teach you. Um, and we, there's going to be a link. You can, you can select the time that, you, you know, you can speak with us, one of our, um, you know, qualified agents, but really what we want to have is, is that conversation with you about how to bank better. Think about this. If, if somebody, if you gave, if, if I gave you a quarter for every dollar, uh, no, for every hundred dollars that you gave me, right? You would think I'm crazy, right? But if, if I gave you 25 times more than that, you would think I'm like, you would love me because you're, you're like, you're not getting that from the four sure. big banks, right? Right, right. <laughs> How do, how do you protect your capital? Now, we, we've been talking about that as well. You know, how do you protect your capital, your hard-earned money? Right now, people are sitting on a lot of equity in their home, but it's idle equity. Unless you do anything with it, it's just going to be idle equity. The market tanks, it falls out. You no longer have that equity. You can move that. You can protect right. it. You protect that principle. You right. can also create a legacy, right? Creating a legacy because, you know, we're seeing the biggest wealth transfer right now. But what about your personal economy and your family's personal economy? And where are you going to leave your your family, you know, once 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 you move on? So that's what Velocidas Banking is about, is about mm -hmm. banking better. So obviously, you know, we're, we're passionate about that. That just it, it, it fires me up. I, I love speaking about it. I, it just there's a spark in my eyes. I, you know, my voice, you can sense in my voice. There's a reason why. And in another episode, I'll, I'll share a story of, about why we ended up in this in this situation and why, you know, why I learned so much from it. But let me turn it over to TPF. If you could tell us about Empironomics. Oh, well, Empironomics. Well, great question, by the way. Well, Empironomics is really nothing more. It's an auxiliary to Kingdom Thinking Ministry where we're looking to help people think better, bank better, and leverage better, in essence, to truly walk and live in what we would call a kingdom living. So we, we talk, Lauren touched on the inner, outer, upper, lower. Yeah, so in our lives, we live in a duality. So look at it from this perspective. From an external point of view, we have Empironomics. But from an internal point of view, we have the kingdom. And so scripture says that first seek the kingdom in all of his righteousness, and then all the desires of your heart shall be added unto you. So empironomics is empowering an individual to free themselves from their past. They get to understand, to overstand, and I word understand to overstand their current situation. And then they can uncover the future that they've always wanted because they sought this first. The kingdom, kingdom thinking, how to think. And that's why it's so imperative that you learn how to think better so that you could bank better. Because banking is a skill set. 
It's a series of habits, financial habits that you replicate over and over to yield a result, right? And then couple that with action sets. So yes, Empireonomics is about empowering people to create the lifestyle that they desired, which we call socioeconomic mobility, where you then enhance your social lifestyle and your economic reach. And then you can truly live that life because it's all about creating and creating mass, creating more. And the more that you can create and circulate, you can make the world a better place, right? It's not just about money because you are the money. We're the original Bitcoin, right? Every thought is a fragment of our mind and every word that we speak is coined. So when you think it and speak it, it becomes the original Bitcoin. So we have to begin to know that. And that's what the Empyronomics does. It brings a person back to a place of remembrance because you were dismembered from your true self. Hmm. And so in order to be made whole, you have to remember. So we take you back on a journey and go back to that time where you were, your mind was shaped based on someone else's opinion. Now it's time for you to really live your life in the opinion of how source, the creator, intended for you to be. And when you do that, life becomes very, very simple. Awesome. That's very good. So the solution is take us home. <laughs> take us home. Woo! I'm Lauren, the solutionist. And you guys definitely know by now how I feel about monitoring your credit. But it really stems back to... Um, we don't know this, you know, our society doesn't teach us these types of things because it doesn't benefit those who are moving society, right? Okay. Yep. But credit is options. Credit is money. Credit is access to money. Credit makes your life easier, right? Credit equals easier life because there's options. And we know that we have more, more credit, more cash in our life, you know, oh. um, stress seems to go away you know things are life is just easy so i'm always going to say that fix your credit don't wait i got into credit professionally i don't know if many people actually know this um after my divorce i had always been great at managing and building my credit you know the traditional way but the day after i signed on that line my 840 credit score went down to 520. I think it was actually worse than that. I think it was 476 for a few weeks there. <laughs> One, overnight. Oof, overnight. We didn't have any debt. We didn't own a house that we had to divide. Overnight. Wow. I had all of it taken away from me. But mm. it was proof was in the pudding that you can rebuild your credit profile. Even when you think it was all ripped out from underneath you and you have nothing to start with, that is not true. That is not true. Because our laws and the way they're written, mm -hmm. we're blessed to have them in the way that they are written because we can restore our profiles. Yes. When you know who you are, you can restore your profile. You don't have to wait the 7, 10, 15, or whatever they're telling you type of years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just get in it. Just get in it. Monitor it. Get in it. Call me, call the team. <laughs> awesome. awesome, awesome. All right, awesome. well, you know, with, without any action though, nothing happens. So yeah. it's time for people to click on those links for them, them to be able to make sure that, you know, they could book us all of on our, on our calendars. And, you know, of course there's gonna be a lot of questions and that's exactly why we're here. So we wanna make sure that, you know, we, we thank everybody listening today. Um, well, you know, this is, this is very, very exciting. Um, thank you both for being on with, with, with me today. And uh, until next time, well, we're going to keep talking about this truth and equity. We're going to keep, you know, sharing with you and giving you some really great tools so that you can have that KOS, right? That knowledge of right. self. Knowledge of and self. You, can, you can have a better life. You can, you can you know, leave a, a better legacy for your family and for yourself. So until next time, everybody, this is Minor the principal defender. Talk to you soon. Take care. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. Bye.